freak. I don't want to say it. I was freaking out. <laughs> when that happened in the church, it was so amazing. It was, it was pretty amazing, wasn't it? Yeah. And um, so, with Pastor John, uh, yeah, it was really was amazing. It really we just had a great situation. But funny enough, um, who was there on Sunday? Who was there on Sunday? Who was there on Sunday? So, the main thing God's put on my heart. And I'm doing this wherever I go now. God's told me to help build the nets, right? And so most places I go, I try to give an outline of what the nets are. And then usually there's an emphasis on what I feel God's telling me. And I felt on Sunday the emphasis was the last gate. You know, trying to find what your assignment is, what God's, what is God's assignment for your own personal life. And sometimes there's seasons <coughs> where we just serve the Lord whatever we do. But then there comes a time when God gives you a specific assignment. And that's where I feel like at the moment. I'm, you know, after 40 years of being a Christian, um, about two years ago when the corona started, um, I, I, I'd only just started Uber driving. I'd actually only spent three weeks driving as an Uber driver. <clears throat> and all of a sudden the corona broke out and we had to stay at home. And my mother-in-law at the time has got a lung disease. So she'd be very vulnerable to the corona. So I actually took... The government was offering to pay some money, so I took six months off that the government gave, and I thought, well, I can't drive in here. If I catch something and bring it home, it'll kill my mother You know what I mean? And when you were Uber driving, you were with people all the time. So anyway, yeah, during that six months, I, I was writing this book. I started writing um, about Nehemiah, about the gates. And it's been something to be, God's been opened up to me over a period of a few years. So it didn't just come all at once. It's just been a gradual thing. Anyhow, um, and during that time, I was, I was really seeking God. I said, Lord, I really want to know what you want to do in my life. You know, I've done this, I've done this, I've done that, I've done that. I really want to know, after all the things, that, what do you really want me to do? Right? Okay. And the Lord really spoke to me quite clearly. And at the time, I asked this other church, can you pray and fast and see what God's saying to me? And then that, you know what their reply was? Oh, you have to find out yourself. <laughs> <laughs> And that's probably the best reply, honestly. That's probably the best reply. So anyhow, I, during that time, I really felt the Lord speak to me. It was quite clear. And he said he was going to open doors. Guess what happened? Nothing. <laughs> After that, I went back to Uber driving. And because I was Uber driving, I'd come home really tired. You drive 8, 9, 10 hours a day, you feel tired. And I totally neglected writing this book, right? But I was still praying, I was still reading my Bible, but I just, the book went by the way so, right? And then I think some of you have heard the story on Sunday through the guy that rang me up, the mechanic, and basically thought I was dead. Did you hear that story? Mm -hmm. And that was sort of a wake-up call. Have you done what I asked you to do? Ah! I realised straight away, I haven't done what God's asked me to do. What happens if I did die? So anyhow, carry on from there. And so since then I've been writing the book. And, um, but funny enough, out of all the stuff I've learned, out of those gates, and I've, I've done a lot of notes already, and I've done, I've been working on the sheep gate, I've been working on the old gate, I've got some really good stuff that will go into the book eventually, I've been working on all the different gates, but the main one, funny enough, that God spoke to me the most was the done gate. Can you believe it? So anyhow, I'm going to speak tonight, and after what happened the other day, my brother, I'm just going to read out... Please, God, don't go to the wrong book. No, let's see if I haven't taken the wrong book. Okay. All right. Before we start, I've got a riddle. Is anybody going to figure this out? I'm worried about the teachers because that's pretty bright. What is greater than God, more evil than the devil, the poor have it, the rich don't need it, and if you eat it, you will die? Anybody know? He looks like he knows. <laughs> I won't ask you. You probably know. Anyone else? Anyone? What is greater than God, more evil than the devil, the poor have it, the rich don't need it, and if you eat it, you'll die. Yeah. All right, come on. I reckon this probably knows. Yeah, I say it's money. But... No. Anyone else? Nothing. You got it. Whoa. <laughs> Nothing is greater than God. Nothing is more evil than the devil. 
the poor have nothing, the rich need nothing, and if you eat nothing, you will die. Right. Okay, <laughs> 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 Where'd you hear it? Where'd you hear it? Um, oh no, I guess because uh, there's nothing greater than God. <laughs> <laughs> good on you, that's good on you. I thought it up. That's really good. Alright, tonight we're going to focus on two very important things, right? And that everybody does from the time you're born to the time you die. Guess what it is? So when you're born, one of the first things you start to do is you start to eat. <laughs> what did you say? You breathe. You breathe. <laughs> That's a good start. That's a very good start. We need to breathe. <laughs> but the other thing is... <laughs> Alright, okay, this... Alright, so you, you've heard what I'm like, so it doesn't matter. You eat and you poo. Yes. Alright? You do it your whole life. <laughs> heard the saying, if you don't eat, you don't poop. And if you don't poop, you die. You're a pastor, probably, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Have you heard that saying? Have you actually heard that saying? Has anybody heard that saying? Oh, that's, we used to hear it all the time, so it wasn't you. I was basically the room of my humour for the last 30 years. <laughs> Alright, so, okay, so here we go. Great statistics. On average, a, per a, a woman who lives to 80, no, sorry, on average, a person who lives to 82 years of age, which is a pretty full life, will eat three meals a day which equates to 89,790 meals. Which is phenomenal, isn't it? I think I've had about 790 since I've got here. Right? And the amount of food I've got since I've got to my name. Oh, honestly, it's been amazing. So, all right. Now, this, now we're going to be a bit... The average woman will put 25,920 pounds or 1,000... 1, 117,517 kilos of poop. I'm trying to use that word. By the time she reaches 81. And the average man does it by the time he reaches 76. Yeah. So what does that say about men? <laughs> We're full of it. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay, so these are the stats, guys. Aren't they amazing stats? <laughs> so, um, obviously, you know what we're talking about tonight. That's the gate. But I just thought it on a very simple level. This is why I felt God speak to me today. And this is actually notes I haven't put in my, my book yet. But I'll, I'll tend to put them in later. As in the natural, we are born as babies. And as babies, we start on the milk. With feeding, now comes pooping. When you're a baby, your mother, father look after you. They feed you. They change your nappies. And as you grow into a toddler, mum and dad still look after you. Poo, they cleanse you. And now... The little child starts to grow. You teach that child how to feed itself. Right? So, as babies, who's got kids here? Most of us have got kids. Some of you are going to have kids in the future. All right? Our little babies came along. We've got three boys and we've got twins, so we know about feeding. All right? And so, in the early days, my wife would eat breastfeed. This is the twins now. And, and the other one, too. And then, I would get up in the middle of the because it was two trying to help her, so this is what I know about feeding babies. She would express, and then I'd say, give me the easy one. I'd be there, because I'm half asleep, I'd be going to work So I'd be feeding the baby with the bottle, and fall asleep while I'm doing it, right? And we'd be looking after the twins, you know what I mean? And we did this right through that early stage. So that was the beginning of us nurturing our babies, right? And then as they start to grow, who remembers the stage when your kids were at home and they're sitting in the little high chair and they're all strapped in and you give them a little plate of food and it's going everywhere <laughs> except their mouth. Every now and then they might stick one in their mouth. And you know, you'd be like, oh no, I'm going to clean all this mess up again. You know what I mean? And that was, they had to learn. They had to learn how to feed. So we would help them too because we didn't want to see them starve. We would feed them as well. So that was part of the process of feeding our kids, right? So as little kids, that's just part of the process, isn't it? And then as the kids start to grow, what's the next stage? All right, they, now they get a bit better. They can sit at the table. They can eat. They, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're not as messy. And, and also, the child starts to grow. But also, along that, along that way, how did we start off? We had babies. You got nappies. When our babies, 
Did it poop? We had to, we had so many nappies, you wouldn't believe the nappies we went through. Because you have no idea. I used to get delivered with a van. The van would turn up and come out carrying these nappies. And every week we'd get nappies turning up. We would just go through so many nappies, right? And that was the beginning of eating and pooping, right? And then as our kids grow, when they're little, they go to bed, Mummy, Mummy, Daddy, come to the toilet. Come and what? Great. Right. <laughs> Usually it was always my mum. It wasn't my wife, so it wasn't me. I'll tell you one story. Then. And anyhow, as they grow, they go to the next stage and the next stage, right? I remember one time, they, were only, they weren't even I don't know, 15 months or something, they were little toddlers, tiny little toddlers. And my wife had to go out, she left me at home. <coughs> and when I went, I walked into the room, and they had pulled their nappies off, and they had just plastered the whole room. <laughs> and I started dry reaching. And I was like, and I actually had to run out of the room. I ran out of the room. I rang my wife. You gotta come home now. You gotta come home now. She's like, what's wrong? I can't do this. I can't do this. You gotta come home now. And she had to come home. She had to let, I didn't know what she was doing. She had to leave everything because I couldn't go in the room. I was freaking out. I was like, no way I can't do this. And I tried to tell that story when they turned 21. <laughs> but, um, so they, they go through state, and that's just life, isn't it? That's, but when you get, then there's a, there's a stage now where you teach your children that's part of their own hygiene. They put it there for themselves, right? So as it is in the natural, so it is in the spiritual, right? And so two very important things we've got to do as Christians is we've, we've got to know how to feed. In the early days, we get fed. So... In the natural, me and my wife, we fed the kids, right? So in the you get <coughs> saved, you come to church, a lot of times, I know it as a young Christian, I start reading my Bible. Sometimes people come to church and they just rely on the pastor's message. They do the pastor's message and, and that might be till the next week. You know what I mean? So, and, that's, and that's how they get fed. It's the early days of being a Christian are really important and sometimes that's the time you need to do the most feeding actually need to do the most speed. So these are just principles, right? That we apply now, where we are right now. So part of it, what I see today is some Christians, they never they didn't start strong. So they so when they got to a stage they, they, they haven't matured from they've gone from baby to toddler, but now they should be mature, but the problem is they're not learning to feed themselves. And and when the, and when there is a problem Instead of going to the Lord Himself and they've got something wrong with or there's something they know is not right in their life or sin or a problem, they don't know how to deal with it. So they instantly they go running to a leader or a pastor. Now that's fine in the early days, that's good. That's fine, you know, that's that's part of growth, isn't it? But then there comes a time that's not what it's about anymore. You've, and so what I what I'm concerned is is we're not equipping people properly. We're not equipping people with the Word of God. We're not equipping them learning how to feed themselves. We're not equipping them to know how to, to, to deal with getting rid of the crap in their life, right? And I'm being blunt, and I, and I will be a little bit blunt about it. And I get disgusted by it too. But, but, you know, like I said, the first time God spoke to me, I didn't actually think it was God. I thought, nah, God doesn't talk like that. He does. You know, the Bible's full of stories. I mean, you start looking stuff up. And um, anyhow, so... My concern today is some people aren't doing the basics. Absolute basics. You do not you don't want Christians that are dependent on the pastor and the leaders. You want Christians that know how to feed themselves and you want Christians that know when something's unclean, defiled in their life, they know where to go to deal with it. And it's with the Lord. It's with the Lord. You know, it's and that to me, when I study the scriptures, and we'll get to some of these scriptures in a minute speaks about sanctification. It speaks about getting clean, right? And it's it's daily. Sanctification is a daily thing. It's out of our relationship. Sanctification is a daily thing. We wash daily. We eat food daily. You know what I mean? So now, who in here knows how to use a concordance? One person? Two? Three? Okay, now 
Right? Like, how many, lift up your hand right now. I actually want to see how many people know how to use a concordance. One, two, three, four, five. Okay. All right. Now, how many people here have been a Christian more than five years? Okay. Yeah, this is exactly what I'm talking about. All right. When I got saved, I came from, I really did come from a gang, and it was black to white. It really came, we came out of a pretty violent sort of background. We used to go on the weekends, fighting was our weekend out. My friend said to me, oh, I didn't have a good weekend. You know why I didn't have a good weekend? Oh, you didn't get a fight this weekend. It wasn't a good weekend. You know what I mean? That's what we were like. Friday was like normal for us. You know what I mean? And and so when we got saved, it was other, many, many other things that were in our lives that weren't were very good, but it was black to white. So when I got saved, I did have a hunger for God. I had a real hunger for God. So by, the, by 1983, I was in Bible college, which is two years after I was saved. And this, what I'm going to teach tonight is very simple and it will change your life. We got ta- I got taught this by one of my lecturers, a pastor by the name of Les Garrett. Who remembers the song? This is the day, this is the day that the Lord... This guy, this guy got the song, Les Garrett. He went all around the world. He's probably one of the best Bible teachers I've ever heard. And he's famous for this one song. I don't think he ever heard any other songs. But he got this one song from the Lord. This is the day. And it went everywhere. He used to preach in Africa. He used to preach in Asia. He went all around the world as a teacher. He was an amazing teacher. And one of the first things he taught us in Bible college was, okay, we read the Word of God. That's food. Great. Right. But now, as you start to grow, God wants you to know how to make a meal. Now, when your kids are growing up, who has the kids hanging around when you're cooking and they want to get involved? Any of you? My kids were boys, so one of them did. <laughs> you know, and the others did sometimes, but and my boys have learned how to cook. Now, I cook 80% of the time at home. I love cooking. I'm Italian. <coughs> I'm very passionate about cooking. My wife's a good cook, but for her it's a chore. For me it's a passion. So that's why I end up cooking a lot more than her, right? But, so I've learned how to cook in the kitchen, ingredients, put this with that, put this with this, this goes together really well. So I learned how to cook. What I want to teach tonight, now some of you guys already know this, but for the sake of the others, but also what I'm seeing down the road is the days when the fish start to come in and we're going to have to nurture the early baby Christians and we need to get them to a point where they can feed themselves and they don't have in sanctification in their life. They know how to deal with crap in their lives, right? So this is what the message is about, all right? So, all right, so on your, these days, you can download it right now. We're going to do it right now. We're going to download it. Who's, who, who reads King James Bible? Anyone? Everyone reads the other translation. all right? <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. The first Bible I ever read was a Good News Bible, right? Very simple translation. I loved it. I thrived on it. I read the New Testament in one week. That's because I got saved, I lost my license, and I sold my car in the same week. <laughs> so I had a whole week of reading the Bible. I literally read the New Testament in one week. Then I went up, but not I was saying, the lady that led me to the Lord, her husband came out and gave me a Bible. And I was so hungry, I knew something happened that night. I had a born again experience. The next day was like, I'm looking at the trees and the flowers and oh, it's so beautiful. I don't know what I was looking at the other 19 and a half years, but that day, you know, it was the beginning of the Lord opening my eyes to everything again. So, okay, so let's, 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 can we get good reception here? Okay, no, I, I, I think, uh, and most of the data, most, most of us have data. Okay, all right, if you can get, if you can get reception, what I want you to do, now I'm, I'm going to give you a great hint, which I learned from my pastor, Liz Garrett, who taught me how to open up the Bible, right? And I've been doing it for 40 years. So I've spent 40 years studying the Bible, literally, right? I love the Bible. I, my Bible's like a cover book. Everywhere you look, it's like a cover book. But I, I love the Word of God. I love the Word of God. <coughs> so, so what he taught us was, he said, use King James Version, because it's actually quite a good translation if you study it. Not for reading. Reading, you can read any Bible, you know, because you get sort of the gist of everything the story is telling you. But when you study, you want to be able to open up words, because words are packed with truth. 
absolutely packed. And when you start to open up the words, then all of a sudden you start to connect a lot more dots in the Bible. There's so many things that connect in the Bible. You know, there's so many books that connect, this book connects to that book, and that book connects to this, this story connects to that story. So, but to do that, you've got to start reading more of the Word of God, and then you've got to go a bit deeper. All right? So this is how to feed yourself better. All right? So if you want to try and download the King James Version Bible, and the other thing I want you to download is a Strong's Concordance. All right? A Strong's Concordance. This is going to be for you that haven't has never done this stuff before. And this is for the harvest that's coming in. <coughs> because one day you guys are going to be looking after babes, right? And you've got to get them to a place where they're mature enough to look after themselves, right? You've got to, if we've got to learn to do this now because when, when the harvest starts to come in, if we're not equipped, we, we are going to have a terrible time. And like what I was talking about, we're going to have a broken net and we'll lose all our fish. Or we lose so many of our fish, we come in one door and go out the other. We don't want that. We want people to be looked after, we want people to love. And we've got to get them into the Word of God and we've got to get them learning the basics. And the basics is food and poop. That's honestly, that's the basics. So that's where you start, when you start growing. And then after that, there's so much other stuff that God adds to our life. Okay. When you get those apps, can you please put up your hand if you've got them? All right? Okay, there's a few of us nearly there. Try and just... Which one? Which one? Which try, one? try and get a good strong concordance. Right? A strong concordance. strong concordance with KJV. Okay. Strong so you want a King James Version Bible and you want a strong concordance. Yeah. Okay? All right? Now you're from the class, are you? Here we go. Anyone else got it yet? Anyone else got it? I, 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 oh, it's roaming, isn't it? Roaming. Roaming, okay. okay. Well, try and get it, try and get it. This is really good if you get it. Because I, then I can take you step by step. I did this with Adrian's wife the other night. We were sitting in, together on the couch at their house. And she asked me a couple of questions, and I said, I'll show you how to open up the Bible the way I've learned. Right? And she loved it. She absolutely loved it. Okay, so we want a King James Version Bible, and we want a strong concordance, because a strong concordance gives you the Hebrew meaning. And the Greek meaning. The Old Testament is written in Hebrew, the New Testament is written in Greek. Right? So it gives you the Greek meaning and it gives you the Hebrew meaning. And when you open these books up in Hebrew, it always gives you a number, and the same with Greek, it gives you a number. And so what happens when you look up a word, and I'll show you how we're gonna we're gonna do it together in a minute, we're actually gonna do it together. They say when you teach people. You do it with, first you teach them what it is, then you do it with them, and then you're on your own. But, if you be a slow learner like me, first you do it with me, and then you do it with me again, then you do it with me again, and then you do it again. I was always the, not the brightest one in the class. So, especially at school. But I've, I've learned a lot by watching, and, I've, and sometimes I need a lot of repetition before I learn stuff. But I do learn. Right, so, repetition is a great teacher. All right, how are we going? Anyone else got it now? Can I see some hands? Who's got it? We're getting there. Good. Who else has got it? We're getting there? You've got it. You're right, haven't you? You've already got it. Anyone else? Anyone else? Who hasn't got it? So I can see who's still trying to get it. Okay, you haven't got it yet? Now, who's really good on technology? Maybe help some of these people that are good on technology if they need help. Because I rely on my sons. I am hopeless with technology. Okay, so help these guys get there. Oh, yeah. Mike doesn't seem to show show the numbers, but uh, it shows the cross references. You what? Now. Yeah. 
What you'll find, normally there's another spot that you go in, there's another spot that goes in, and then when you press on it, it will give you numbers off. All right? Can you help that brother? See, what he's trying to find is the Hebrew numbers and the Greek numbers. Anyone else got it? Are we, are we making progress? Take something else about the concordance. The concordance will give you, say we look it up a word, and I'm going to look up a word in this minute. It, right? If we look up the word milk, right, we're going to, we're going to look this up in a minute. It'll actually tell you every single spot in the Bible where that word milk appears. It'll tell you if it's in Genesis, it'll tell you if it's in Exodus, and it gives you it in, in order and actually shows you. Where that word milk appears, it will tell you the chapter, it will tell you the verse. And then, when you put open up that number, it'll actually, it's like a dictionary. It begins to open up that word. Alright? Okay? So how are we going? Who's, who's at that point now? Are we getting close? Are we getting close? What about you guys? Okay. You got it? You got the numbers? Yeah. Awesome. You got it? Awesome. Alright, awesome. Okay. Are we now? Is everybody? How do you go? We, we on with you? Oh, yeah, it's loading. Okay, it's not loading. Yeah, okay. here's it's gonna take a while. Yeah. All right, okay. What I'll start to do, I'll start to move into the lesson, right? And then, if there's other people, like I'm happy to help you after. If you want to hang around, or maybe on Sunday after church, I'm happy to help people. Or if you, you know, during the week while I'm here, if you want some help with any of this stuff, I'm available. I'll, I'll, I'll help anybody that wants to learn this stuff, right? So this is to, to equip you guys. The Bible says to equip you, right? All right. So have we got there? All right. Let's let's, let's start to move on now. Now we're gonna we're gonna learn how to do a Bible study. So we're trying to learn how to open up the Bible now with the concordance, right? Now on your on your phone, just simply by using Google, you can use that as a dictionary. You can find anywhere you want. But I always start first with the Hebrew and Greek meaning. Once I know whatever those words are, then I'll go to the dictionary to open it up even further. So I use the, I use the concordance, find the word, find out what the word, meaning of the word is, and then I use the dictionary to open it up further. Okay, so this is going to be a good one tonight. First Peter chapter 2, verse 2. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby. So tonight, babes need milk, correct? Right? And we give our babies milk. And as we grow up, we give our kids milk, right? And as they grow, we continue to give them milk. So tonight, this is all about growth. This is going to give you spiritual growth. For some of you guys, you've not had this experience yet with the Word of God, and you're going to have it now. You're going to learn how to get the meat out of the Word of God. You're going to learn how to make meals. You're going to learn how pastors and preachers prepare their messages. You're going to learn all this stuff now, right? Because you need to be equipped. Alright? Okay, so the newborn babe desire the sincere milk of the Word of God. Look up the word sincere because we're in the New Testament now. Look up the word sincere. Now, whoever finds it first, I want you to read out what it says. You found it? Yeah. Okay, what number is it? Uh, G97. Yes, I've got the same one as you. What does it say? Um, Adolus. Um, Are you starting to say it? Yeah, Adolus. It's Adolus. Get someone, get someone to help. It's a hard word, I know. <laughs> it's unadulterated. No, he was saying the Greek. He was saying oh, the Greek. Oh, oh, sorry. Sorry, brother. Sorry. Sorry. Now, tell us, tell us. Don't worry about the Adolos, Greek part. Adolos, it's no, that, Greek. That's, yeah. that's, that's it. Good. You want to learn how to pronounce it? Ten points. But I'm not trying to teach you how to pronounce it. I'm just trying to teach you what does the word mean. In English. So what, is, what does it mean in English? What's the word? Unadulterated. Yes. And what else? Um, yeah, sincere. Yeah, sincere. Okay. Sincere and unadulterated. Okay. So when we went into this word sincere, what is it telling us? 
It's telling us unadulterated and sincere, okay? So, all right, now we're going to use our dictionaries. Everybody find the word unadulterated in their dictionary. So go on your app. Some people have got a dictionary app already on their Bible, I mean on, the, on their phone. Go into your, into your um, app or go onto Google. I, I use Google. Google's pretty good. You got it? Yeah. All right. So read out what it says. Having no inferior added substances, pure. Yep. Who can open up a bit more? Because when you go to dictionaries, you'll find some dictionaries open up a bit more. So that's good. I've got the same as you. And you might find even more. So anyone else got some more? Anyone else got any more? Not mixed or diluted with any different or extra elements, complete and absolute. Okay. Anyone else got any more? All right. I've got what you've got. Unadulterated. From the diction. Not spoiled or made weaker by the addition of other substances. Not diluted or made impure. The Bible is called the Holy Bible. Do you know, anybody know what holy means? Pure. Do you know what the word Bible means? Book. It's the pure book. God's word is the pure book. Right? So here's, here it's telling us when we start to study the word of God, he wants to give us the sincere milk, and the sincere milk is pure. It's unadulterated. It's not diluted. You know, it's not weak. God's word is powerful, sharp. Sharper than a two-edged sword. All right, let's go to the next word that's there. Sincere. Who? Look up sincere. Anybody got it? Uh, free from pretense or deceit, proceeding yeah. from genuine feelings. Yeah, keep going. All right, then there's another one of of a person saying what they generally feel or believe, not dishonest or hip hypocritical. Yeah. I've got the exact same one you looked up, so I looked it up. Wherever you landed, I landed. <laughs> right? So, so sincere means free from pretense or deceit, proceeding from genuine feeling, sayings, what they genuinely feel or believe, not dishonest or hypocritical. So the Word of God is telling us it's not deceitful. It's genuine. It's, it's not dishonest and it's not hypocritical. This is what it's telling us about the word. So just that one word, does that mean more to you now? Is it, who thinks now when they read that word sincere, it means more to them? Can you see how you've got a bit of meat now out of that one little word? Right? Who got that? Alright? Anyone know? So, okay, so we're not going to, now, I'm not going to go a lot further now, but what, why do we feed babies milk? You know? Why do we feed babies milk? Because that's the only thing they can handle at that time. Yes. And what else? What's another reason we give milk? And when the kids grow, why else do we give our kids milk? Mum, come on, mum. To grow strong. Yes. What part of the body will grow strong? Bones. Bones. Spot on. Why? Is milk so important? Because it grows the bones strong. The bones is the skeleton. It's the foundation, isn't it? <coughs> so what is the, what is the Bible teaching us here? It's teaching us that when we get the milk and we start to feed it to the baby Christians, and, and even as our kids grow up, one of my kids loves milk. He used to drink so much milk, I couldn't believe how much milk. And he's the biggest, most solid one of my kids. He's really stocky. He was the one that loved the milk, right? Strong bones. We need the strong foundation as Christians. If we don't put this into people, the word we don't teach them how to feed on the word of God. If we don't give them the milk, they will not have a good foundation. And then we get fused down the track. And you've got Christians that are chucking in their faith or life. They have not learned, they have not learned from God's word, because the word of God instructs us in everything, right? And teaches us and guides us and leads us. The Word of God does all that, but if you don't learn to turn to the Word of God, in all these things, somewhere down the track, like Jesus said, the one who built his house on the rock, what did he have? Good foundation. Other people, they heard the Word of God, but usually they're the ones that just the <coughs> church, but they had sand for the foundation, and what happened? It collapsed. So if you don't 
raise your children properly or feed them properly and give them a good diet, you'll weaken their bodies. Is that true? They want healthy kids, especially in the early days, they're going to give lots of milk and then feed them properly, right? So this is foundational stuff. So I hope you guys, I'm not going to go any further with it now, I hope you guys take this, it's just basics, and start to use it because for me it changed my walk as a Christian. It actually opened up the Bible. So when I was hearing things, I would always go, well, what does that word mean? Well, what does that mean? And I, I'm, I constantly do it. I constantly do it. I'm always looking up words. I'm always wanting to know. Them. One good thing that was good for me, I was dumb at school. It wasn't that I was dumb. I was the rebel. I was the one that got expelled. I was the one that wanted to muck around with my friends. I was the one that was always in trouble. I was always in punch up. I was, that was me. My first job, I had three fights in seven months. I got my head beat twice. <laughs> well, once, 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 once. I was five guys at 23 and I was 16. And so for me, for me, it, that's where the turning point was learning to attach to the Word of God. All right? And it will. It will change your life. And I'm trying to equip you so that your walk with God gets deeper. All right? Now, and what saddens me and what I see, I've been a Christian for a long time, is I see a lot of weak Christians. I do. And they, they have a weak faith. And like the Bible says, they blow the wind to and fro. A lot of them end up out of church. A lot of them end up disillusioned. And I think, what happened? What happened? Well, let's go back to where I, I believe a lot of times they didn't get a good foundation. That's what I believe happened. They didn't get a good foundation. This is to get a good foundation for you. And I'm really emphasising it tonight. There's coming a time we're going to see the Spirit of God move, and I'm not in my spirit, and it's going to blow us away. And it's the stuff that we've read about in books, the stuff we heard over, happened over here, happened over there. It's coming. It's going to be worldwide. But what are we going to do when it comes? Are we going to are we going to look after the ones that God brings in? Are we going to know how to feed the babies? Are we going to raise them? Are we going to teach them how to to do all these things? All right. So let's move on now. Okay. Now, now let's look at what the Bible says, what defiles us. Okay, so we've been talking about dung, we've been talking about rubbish, we've got to get rid of it. Why do we get rid of Our body gets rid of waste, right? We've got to stay healthy. If your body doesn't get rid of it, it'll make you sick. It'll actually make you sick, right? So why do we get rid of rubbish? Well, if you don't get rid of the rubbish, right, same thing, you know what I mean? In, I think there's one uh, city in Italy, the mafia controls it, and they they started blackmailing people by not taking the rubbish away. I think it's some um, Naples or something like that. And they were they'll rubbish everywhere. The mafia started to control the rubbish, and they were able to blackmail businesses and other people to do what they want. Because you imagine you've got a restaurant, and the, the rubbish is just piling up, piling up, piling up. Everything starts to stink. Everything's starting to get unhygienic, and you can't get rid of your rubbish because the mafia's going, no way, mate, I'm not to your pay you know? And that's what was happening in Naples. So, all right, so let's have a look at what the Bible says, what defiles us. Matthew chapter 15, 10 to 20. Do you not understand, and this is Jesus talking, that whatsoever enters in the mouth goes into the belly, and is cast into the drawer to the tandas. I learned that 30 years ago. Alright, which is the toilet, right? So <coughs> Jesus is saying, but those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and that's what defile a man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornication, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are things which defile a man. This is what God sees as the fallen man and making man filthy. Those are the things that make us filthy. That's what makes us filthy in the eyes of God. When he looks at that, he sees us filthy. Alright? In the book of Zechariah, I quoted this on Sunday. Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and stood before the angel. Alright, let's, let's look it up because we just learned how to do it. This is the last one for the night. I will do with the dictionaries in a minute. What does filthy mean in that chapter? So you've got to go to Zechariah. I want you to find out what filthy means. I want you to see it for yourself. 
Jacob with. It's Je Zechariah 3 3. And the word we're looking up, he was clothed <coughs> with filthy garments. That's it. Oh. Yeah, I'm about to say, which is which is in Hebrew. Oh, sorry, yeah, it's in Hebrew, it's the Old Testament. What does it say? Uh, Phil T S in excrementitious. Yeah, excrementitious. Okay. And the other word is what? There's another word there as well. Soil. Soil. Okay. So what's excrementitious? It's what we've been talking about all night. Isn't it? It's excrement. It's excrement. What's so here's Joshua, the high priest, and Satan's about is accusing him, right? Why is he accusing him? Because he's covered in filth, that's why he's accusing him, right? And then what does the angel say? Tell him to take his filthy garments off. The filthy garments is not dirt, it's excrement. It's real filth, right? Okay? And and, and what's able to happen? Satan's coming against him because there's filth in his life. He's wearing a filthy garment. And God's the angel God said, yeah, told the angel to take the garments off. Right. Okay, so now the parable of the wedding, right? Who knows the parable of the wedding? And everyone goes to the wedding, and one of them, what happens to one of them? He's Do you remember? Wearing, he's not wearing the right garment. Or what happens? He gets thrown out of the wedding. Who wants to go to the wedding feast of the lamb? Who wants to go? I want to go. I want to be there. I'd like to be in the bride, actually. I'd like to be part of that bride. And this is, if we go to the book of Revelation now, now we, I want everyone to look this one up. This is Revelation chapter 3, verse 4. And, and tonight, for some people, it might rock your theology, but you need to look at it, all right? All right, so this is Jesus speaking to the seven churches. Which Revelation 1? Revelation chapter 3. And found it. Uh, start, we'll start from verse 1. And the angel, and unto the angel of the church of Sardis, write these things. He that have the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, I know thy works, that thou hast a name, and that thou livest, and art dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain, that are ready to die. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember therefore how. It has what thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come to thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Thou hast few knaves in Sardis which have what? Not defiled their garments. And they shall walk in white, and they are worthy. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will what? Not Look at his name out of the book of life. Okay, let's look at a couple of things here. He's, he's, he's rebuking this church because of what's going on, right? Now he comes along and he says, there's, only, there's some of you, there's only a few of you that haven't defied your garments, right? It's the same word we've been looking at. It's in the Greek. If you looked up the Greek, it means soiled, right? That's the Greek word. To make unclean, dirty, filthy, sore one's clothes stain. That's the Greek meaning of that word. Right? And Jesus comes along and he's happy with the few of them. And he says, You clothed in what? I'm happy with you. You've done, you know, you, you're walking in my ways. You're walking in righteousness. You're living a holy life. You've been, you've been working on your sanctification. You've been living the way I've asked you to live. But others, he's saying, He that overcomes shall be clothed in what robe, and I will not blight at his name. So what, what does that imply? I will not blot out his name. Who knows about the book of life? Who knows what the book of life is? Lamb's book of life. Yes. <coughs> Tell me what the book of life is. Uh, those who sing the sinner's prayer. And then... So those who receive Christ. So when you receive Christ as your Lord and Saviour, the Bible says the day that happens, the day that it happens, your name gets put into this book. It's called the Lamb's Book of Life. And if you study the book of Revelation, and I've studied it three times, right? All the way through with an expository that big, right? If you study the book of Revelation, right, you'll see that there are those, only those who've got their name in the Lamb's Book of Life are going to make it. If you're not there, you're not going to get in there. It's basically saying, 
If your name's not in that book, you're not getting in. When you see the white throne judgment of God, which is after the thousand years of peace, and then God judges the wicked, none of them, are, none of them have got their name in the Lamb's Book of Life. None of them, right? And here it's implying, because these people have got defiled garments, and they're supposed to be Christians, they were a church, these are believers, he's implying they can have their name removed. They can have their name removed. It's not once saved, always saved. If you start to study the Bible, that is a false doctrine. That is an absolute false doctrine. That is a deception. That means you can live whatever way you want. And that is not what the Bible teaches. Repent and bring forth fruit worthy of repentance. That's what the Bible teaches. Live a righteous life. Live a holy life. Turn away from the world. Turn away from sin. Turn away from evil. That's what it means to be a Christian. Follow Christ. But if you keep defiling yourself, and there's a list there, and if you start reading the book of Galatians, there's another list of, of what the flesh is like and all the things that... And then it starts telling you things like, if you practice these things, you shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And there's a whole list of all these things. Now, I'll be honest. I've, sometimes those things are in my life. Those sins have been in my life as a Christian. As a Christian. Right? And when I read the Bible, and the Bible is a mirror, all of a sudden I get the fear of God. I'm thinking, fuck, oh, this, this isn't right. This is in my heart. This, you know, this is what's wrong. The mirror shows me what's wrong. Now I have to wash. Now I have to get rid of the dung. Now I've got to deal with it. That's, that's how I get sanctified. That's how I get holy. That's how I get pure. Right? But here the Bible is implying if you don't do it, and you get yourself defiled, right? The Bible is telling us, you can have your name taken out of the lambs with the life. That's what it's telling us. Right? And, you, and if you want to go through a bunch more scriptures, I'm happy to do it with you, but I'm not going to do it now. Alright? So, a baby soars its nappy. And that is clothing, isn't it? Right? When we read these scriptures, it's talking about soil clothing, isn't it? And you get older, you've got clothing. We have spiritual garments. That's the garments of righteousness. They're the ones that are supposed to be pure and white. There's other verses in the Bible in Revelation again. He's telling you, make sure you look after your garments. Lest I come and what? Find you naked. Lest I come and find you in your shame. Nakedness is associated with shame. Right? And it's interesting, when you look up the word shame, you know, who knows what a pudenda is? Right? Pudenda is your genitals, right? And so, lest your genitals are exposed, you know, we are all embarrassed. If I walked out in public, you know, and you can see my, I'd be freaking out. I'd be going, ah, I'm trying to cover up. This is the kind of shame God's saying. But he goes, unless I come and I expose you and I shame you out. You know what I mean? It's saying for men and women, for all of us. None of us like to get caught. We used to have this commercial. They get caught with your pants down. You don't want to get caught with your pants down. All right, so, um, so here's God saying, when I come back, make sure you've got your garments Lest I find you naked, lest I find you in your shame. And that ain't going to be good if you ain't going to be Alright, so this is, this is the stuff we've got to learn as Christians. This is the stuff we've got to teach the new believers. Alright? Okay? Don't tell them, oh, you, you said the prayer now, you're on your way to heaven. It's all great. That's, that's some of the teaching in some of the churches. You're on your way to heaven. Oh, it doesn't matter now. You've accepted Jesus, but you're still living like the dead. How can you be following Jesus if you still live like the devil? The Bible says, let every man who names the name of Christ depart from sin. If you call yourself a Christian, depart from sin. Okay, so not much more than really done, guys. Okay? Jesus Christ loved the church and he gave himself up. This is Ephesians 5 26. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word. It's applying God's word to ourselves that we are washed. If you already do this and you've matured, then help others that haven't done it. Right? Jesus said, wash one another's feet. Right? He said, <coughs> then as long as we can heal the baby, we can look after the babies, the toddlers, and help them grow. Learn how to feed them and feed ourselves. Cleaning them and cleanse ourselves. So I found my work with God, but like even this morning I got up and something happened last night. And I, I just I was trying to pray about it before I went to bed. I was upset about it. 
I just thought, uh, I, I don't, I'll be honest, I'll tell you what it was, I was gossiping about something that happened. And, and then I felt so bad, and I thought, that's so wrong, why am I disclosing something? And it was to do with one of my friends back in Australia. Now they don't know that friend at all, but I still felt wrong when I did. I was talking about my friend of mine that's gone through some trials, and then I thought, and I even named him, and they, I know they didn't know who he was, but by the time I went to bed, I was like, I should have done that, I should have spoke about that. Yes, he's gone through some trials, but the way I, it wasn't appropriate what I did. So then this morning I got up and I was repenting again. And I said, Lord, I had such an amazing day when we went to that church. I was blown away by what God did. And that's been happening all week. All week, all these things have been freaking me out. Even the wine's been freaking me out tonight. And, and <laughs> <laughs> if you knew the story, there's a big story behind that one too. But um, all week God's been just turning up and powerful away. And I said, Lord, it's been so amazing. I don't want to lose that. I don't want to lose what you're doing. And I repented and I got my heart right. What was I doing? I was getting rid of the crap again. And I was asking God to wash me clean again. Lord, I'm sorry, I'm not going to do that. And then I went and apologised to my friends that I shared that with. And I said, I did the wrong thing last night. I didn't feel right about it. And we talked about it. And then we shared some stuff on the Bible. And then we, it was good. We cleared, we cleared the air. It was good. And we all felt the same. We thought, oh, because it was like the night started to go south, or whatever you want to call it. Things started to go the wrong direction, it became a bit negative, and I thought, this isn't right, this isn't right. And then we all felt the same way. So this is a learning, how, this is how you get sanctified, isn't it? Because along the journey, <coughs> guess what? We get dirty. Guess what? We use the toilet every day. Guess what? We shower every day. I shower about four times in the year. No, I'm showering all the time, I can't help it. Um, it's part of staying clean, isn't it? It's part of our walk. And if you don't learn to do this, I'm going to finish here. The disciples walked with Jesus for three and a half years. And in the story where Jesus is talking to the disciples, he's washing their feet. And Peter's going, no, 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 don't wash my feet. And he goes, unless I wash your feet, you have no part in me. Right? And Jesus then he goes, oh, wash everything, wash everything. And then Jesus goes, no, 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 just let me wash your feet. Right? And then he washes his feet. And then later on he's talking to these disciples. Right? These 12 guys have been with him for three and a half years. They've seen miracles. They've seen blind eyes open. They've seen deaf people healed. They've seen people that couldn't walk raised. They've seen the multitudes fed. They've been there when he rebuked the storm. And, and, the, and They've seen it all, man. These guys have seen amazing stuff. Mind-blowing stuff. I want to see that stuff. I've seen little things. but I, They saw it. They were with Jesus. And then Jesus says... And he's talking about washing, and he goes, but well, one of you is unclean. And he called him a devil. And we know what he's talking about. He's talking about Judas Iscariot. For three and a half years he walked with Jesus. The other guys were starting to get clean. Their lives started to change. They were being sanctified. They were, they were being taught how to walk in righteousness and holiness. They had turned away from sin. The first thing Peter said when Jesus done the miracle, depart from me, I'm a sinful man. Later on he's a changed man. He ends up becoming... You know, the great apostle Peter, right? But he, he says, Judas, you know what's amazing about that? None of the other guys knew who it was because when, when they're at the Last Supper, who is it? Jesus said, one is going to betray him. <gasps> who is it? Ask Jesus, get John to ask him. <laughs> they didn't even know who it was. How can you be with this, the guy that's doing all the Why? Because it was a hidden thing. It was a thing of the heart. Judas never got clean. Judas never dealt with sin. He was a thief and he's still a thief. The Bible says he kept stealing money out of the money bag. What does he do? He ends up betraying Jesus for money. The other guys have changed men. They had been washed, they had been cleansed. You can be amongst Christians and never change. It's scary. You can be in church and be a, a tear and not wheat. You can be a goat and not a sheep. And you can be sit right next to the person and don't even know it. And I, I've always prayed, Lord, don't let me be a tear, Lord, I don't want to be a tear. I pray that because I see the tears of my own heart and I want to be washed. I want that stuff out of me. God, get that stuff out of me. Right? So, it's very important that we become the people that God has called us to be. A washed, sanctified, beautiful, glorious God. Because that's what Jesus is coming back for. You know what I mean? Not a dirty, filthy, smelly person. No, we're washed, we're cleansed by the blood of Jesus. We're washed by the water of His Word. We're set apart for Him. We're no longer part of this, this world's 
on its way to hell. Without Christ, if they stay in their sin, this world is on the way to hell. That's the truth. So it's a heavy message, but it's part of the, part of the dumb gate. And these are my new notes that have to go with it. So, but um, and it's also part about learning as babes to feed on the sincere milk of the word of God. So for you guys, I hope you put into practice how to use a concordance and a dictionary. Because I find if you do it when you're doing it, and what I find now, I don't read, I don't read the big passages of the Bible. I, I just sit on one verse and I just start looking up all the, all the names and what they mean. And, and I'm thinking about other stuff that I've read and think, oh, far out, that connects with that, and that connects with that. Oh, I didn't know that. You know what I mean? And you'll be blown away how much meat you get out of it. It, it will feed you, it will sustain you, it will help you to grow. Because that's what it says, help you to grow. So, okay. So now, now have we got enough time? How do we run faster? Five to miss. All right. What I want to do is. Anybody that wants prayer tonight, because I know some of you are taking on.